here. All I'll say is I've known David for a few years and I've got the scars to prove it. And um, But I'm always engaged by the fact that he's really keen on balancing not just the, the technical analytical side, but the emotional and people side of change in everything that he does. And I think tonight's conversation is really going to play in that second half because it's very, very important in the conversations I've had with David about the fact that we can't achieve anything unless the people are on board with us in doing things. So we really need to focus on how we support and develop individuals and groups of people, as that may be the case, to actually help us through the change journey. And Brittany is the founder of Graphic Journeys. So again, not going to read all the stuff up there, but of course, those of you on the YouTube can press pause at this moment in time and actually read this stuff and everything that go up. Um, but she's really engaging in doing all the graphical facilitation, recording, capturing visual um, conversations, I suppose, situations, how people are engaging with each other in a visual format. So I know um, David will explain a little bit more about how that's going to work and interact with are we going into this evening's conversation? Um, but really pleased to have Brittany on board and uh, sharing her, uh, her her visual mastery in the graphical space. So um, that would be all good fun. So without further ado, we're going to flip over to let David take control of the screen and get you conversing and listening to everything. I'm going to put myself on mute. I ask everybody else to put themselves on mute if they can. Doesn't mean you have to stay there. If you need to say something, by all means, do unmute yourself. But no matter how great you think your classical or EDM music is for yourself, the rest of us might not want to hear that. Or any dogs barking or children screaming or things like that. It just forms a bit more disruption for everything. But, you know, we're going to talk about disruption tonight. So without further ado, over to David. Take it away and make magic. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. it, it it's always weird getting introduced because, uh, yeah, you think, did I do all that? Um, so as mentioned, we've got a special guest tonight. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give us an opening context. And then I'm going to get Brittany to, to pop in and just show us what she's doing in the background. We were really hoping to actually have it like live cast simultaneously. Um, but we're, we, we've got a, a, a pretty good um, substitute for that. What's really kind of going to be neat, though, is at the end of this hour, you're going to receive, or you're going to be able to actually download out of the chat um, the results of her work as, as it gets live scribed as we go. <clears throat> so as I was putting this together, um, I've been, been connecting with my network, uh, I've been chatting with different people, and um, someone said something last week that was really, really intelligent, and I wrote it down. So I apologize because I, I don't remember exactly who it was. I think it was on one of these ACMP sessions. It said about connection. Change is about human connection. And I thought, you know, that really sums it up brilliantly, simply. And when we think about connection and the fact that we are physically distant, but we are socially connected, and what I'm starting to see now is after the initial disruption, as, as we go through storming and we you know, go through farming and we're getting into norming, um, I'm finding that people are actually connecting better than they were before COVID. And I'd love to hear from people if, if they're seeing that same uh, result. And I've got a, a screenshot up of my team. We're doing a, a daily check-in at 10 a.m. every morning. So we get onto, onto, onto Zoom and we just, we just check in with each other and see how we're doing. And we're getting to know each other better and deeper than we were before, which is pretty incredible because at Juice, we know each other really well. It, it really has a very, very close family feel to it. But, you know, I, I feel like it's actually going that, that extra bit. And change is about that human connection. It's not about products. It's not about timelines. It's not about dollars. Because change happens up here in my brain, not, you know, change happens when I decide, not, not when you tell me to. So tonight is about humans and connection and, and how we can connect to it better. And just before I, I launch us into our first interactive piece, I'm going to pass it over to Brittany for a few moments, and she's going to just give us a quick little window into her world and what she's working on in the background. So Brittany? Let me do that for you. <clears throat> and we practiced this tech switch over <laughs> several times today. Yeah. So of course, it's going to be perfect, right? Should be great. Let's see. Okay, so uh, this is, let me make it fuller screen for everyone. 
Uh, so this is what I will be doing. So I'm going to be digitally scribing uh, David's presentation from my iPad on Procreate. Uh, so that means um, graphic recording means I'll just be capturing the key points of what's said and pairing it with illustration. So I hope you guys enjoy the final result of that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we're going to be checking in with uh, Brittany a couple times through the uh, through the session to see how that's progressing. Um, I've worked with Brittany uh, in person, actually, in in-person sessions and had her there in the room scribing as we're talking. And it's just magical because as we're, you know, weaving our tales and people are chiming in and, and, and folks are, you know, going into breakouts and having experiences, all of this is being captured. And it just really enhances the experience. So I was really happy that Brittany was able to join us today. Thanks. Um, theme of connection. And I want to ask you this question. I'm going to get you to chime in either on the chat or unmute yourself. Um, what I've done here is I've got a picture uh, that I took last summer. I took my niece and nephew out to Bon Echo Park. And we spent uh, about four days canoeing, hiking, camping. We did a... a a, a nice loop trail with with several portages one that was a kilometer and a half and it was just a great experience and, and I did this because I wanted to get that you know deeper connection with with my niece and nephew and it was just a, a fantastic thing and I'm really seeing that as I you know as we you know go visit for Christmas and birthdays and you know Easter and various events and j just feeling that deeper connection so that's a little window into my world so I want to ask you how are you and I connected and again, chime into the chat. And this may be in the form of, you know what, you like fishing or, or you like canoeing or, or you actually hate camping. Uh, that's the way we're actually connected. So just like to hear from you, how are we connected? So we can either do this on chat or unmute your mic and let me know. This is the interactive piece where you all start talking. <laughs> Hi, David. It's Phil. I, we're, we're connected in so many ways. I think when, when we first uh, chatted, it's your backdrop and, and sort of the love of nature. It's the, uh, the connection with family and, and wanting to have joint memories. And I think your session today will be a memory that all of us will share. Uh, and then also, I think, you know, since we're, uh, you know, change practitioners or we, we sort of have the same sort of desire to help people, I think that just goes as a beautiful foundation for our connection. Love it. Thank you so much, Phil, for getting that started. We're getting some people chiming in on the chat. So uh, we both care about change is human. Absolutely, Chelsea. Love that. You know, it requires us to reach people on that personal level. And it's, I always find it fascinating that companies and businesses and business in general say, well, we want the whole person to show up for work. But no emotions, thank you. Right? It's like, no, that is part of the whole person, right? Um, from Rich, maximizing human potential, absolutely. I think we're, we're definitely brothers in arms on that one, my friend. Dimple, appreciation uh, for human nature, um, absolutely. So taking that, that nature piece and, you know, looking at us and how we operate. Um, Alex, uh, having something to say about resiliency during change and, and wanting us to hear it. <laughs> Love that connection. That's awesome. So we think about how we are connected. And my second question for you is, um, how do we normally connect? Because we are in very unusual times right now. I want to just start to think about how we normally connect. So let's, let's roll the clock back six months. You know, this, this COVID thing hasn't hit our, our zeitgeist yet. It hasn't, it hasn't become something. Um, how do we normally connect with other people? Actually do that tangibly. I see names out there. I know you're there, folks. Social settings, gym meetups, right? Absolutely. So, you know, we had this natural interaction when we're out doing our thing, going to the gym, even going to the lunchroom. Um, please write your questions, comments, unmute if you need. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, similar experiences that we share from Edwina, absolutely. And, and you think about when we have those deeper connections with people, you think about the, the people that you know, that you've known for years and you have those big, deep connections. 
it, it's about the experiences. It's about the things that we've shared together that we've gone through. And oftentimes having those difficult challenges that we've, you know, we faced together, we helped each other and we overcame creates that deeper connection. Um, love Chelsea's comment, coffee chats. Yeah, absolutely. Sharing coffee and food and drinks. Absolutely. And this actually ties us right back to the experience in Bon Echo because if you've ever done camping, it's the best food you'll ever have. You know, when you're out there and you've got the fire going and I've discovered that Triscuits with melted cheese are best over an open flame campfire. They get this lovely smoky flavor to them. Oh, it's so good. And I discovered that one somewhere in Alaska. Um, physically over coffee, meetup, um, you know, several interests uh, from Alex, social, uh, social media, coffee meetings, going for walks. Now you notice that a lot of what you're talking about is, well, first of all, it's physical experiences but it's also happenstance. It's, it's the, you know, I ran into you at the gym, I ran into you at the coffee room, these kinds of things. So now that we don't have that, we need to become more prescriptive around how we connect. And this is what I'm seeing is people are becoming much more prescriptive around creating those connections. And hence what's happening is we're actually getting better at it because we're upping our game, we're, do it, we're, we're leveraging the skill. We've had these social media tools for, for years. We really have. I've been doing, you know, uh, webinars and, and virtual training for over 10 years. Um, you know, has it, been, it hasn't definitely been the main. It's been a side. But, you know, the tools have been there, but we just haven't been using them. And the thing is, when we have that good, close connection, and we, we, we look at this image of a, of a mother and her cub, it kind of feels nice, doesn't it? It gives that nice, warm feeling. Well, what you're experiencing is oxytocin. And when we create that connection, oxytocin is released in our brains. And oxytocin is one of those wonderful hormones that gives us energy, makes us feel better. It helps unlock trust and bonding and connection. In fact, mothers, when they first give birth, they actually get a flood of oxytocin. And the, the reasoning behind this is to help them bond with the new baby that's just come out. So when we create that deeper connection, we get these wonderful energizing, enriching hormones that flow through our brains. Now, you do not leave anyone's presence neutral. Every interaction you have with people is either going to create expansion or contraction within their brains. We worked with some healthcare professionals a couple of years back. And there's this one doctor, and the best word for him was tyrant. He would throw charts at people. He would yell and scream. He would throw pagers. He would have tantrums. He would berate people publicly. Now, imagine you are a skilled, experienced healthcare professional, and you're in this person's presence, and you're having to take orders from them. How's your performance right now? Right? People were making dumb mistakes around these, this person. Now, the next day, that doctor was, was not on shift. You had a different doctor come in, and he was collaborative and kind and would take your input and would have a conversation and talk to you like an adult. How's your performance now? And what's happening is we are expanding and contracting people's brains. You've all heard that expression, you're losing your marbles. Well, there's actually a lot, there's some science behind this. In that first scenario with the abusive doctor, you're going to start to lose your executive function. Your amygdala is being triggered. You're going, I need to get the bleep out of here. And your fight or flight instinct is starting to kick in. And what happens is we start to lose our executive function. Now, our executive function, and part of that is the working memory, holds about five to seven pieces of data. So if we take the average of six pieces of data, and let's run the math on this. If I rearrange these, and let's imagine them as marbles. So I've got a green one, a red one, a blue one, a black one, a green one, a yellow one, a white one, that kind of thing. With six of them, I can rearrange them in all different orders. So I can have red, green, yellow, blue. I can have white, you know, blue, green, yellow, red, all kinds of different orders. And if we run the math on it, it's 720 options. It's six factorial. So I start to lose my marbles and I lose just one piece of data. I'm down to 120 options. And if I keep losing those marbles, I get down to two, fight or flight. This is what's happening to people when we get emotionally triggered and how we show up in that relationship, how we show up in that interaction 
is going to either expand someone's brain, release oxytocin, create that connection, that trust, or it's going to contract their brain and they're going to start to lose their marbles. And for those of you who are Seinfeld fans, it takes about 20 minutes for all of this chemistry to wash out of your system. So 20 minutes after that meeting, you're driving home and you're going, ooh, I should have said. Right? This is what's happening because we lose our marbles in the instant and then it comes back to us later. So I want to introduce you to Lindsay. Now, Lindsay, she's got the experience. She's got the, the credentials. She's got the attitude. High performer. But Lindsay's performance is defined by this formula. Energy divided by interference. Energy is a multiplier. It will increase your performance. But interference will divide your performance. And this is where we get into this concept of people can be highly engaged, but exhausted. And you think of when you're in that scenario and you're in that and you're just like, oh, get me out of this now. And you, you feel drained, you feel tired, and it's only 10 a.m. And then there's other days where it's, oh, it's, it's 5.30. What the heck? It feels like 10 a.m. It's like I've got all this energy and, and you know what? I've just, time has flown by. We get in that state of flow. So the question is, how can we energize people's brains? And the first thing I want to take a look at is the interference piece. So again, I'm going to invite you to pop into the chat. I'm going to invite you to unmute your mic. What form of interference has the biggest impact on your performance? And for me, it's, it's team discord. I really, really get energized by an, a harmonious team. And when that team is, is infighting and, and there's, you know, politics and, oh, that just, oh, I can't stand it. It just drives me nuts. I'm, I'm getting back pain just thinking about it. So I want to hear from you. What, what is your biggest interference that impacts your performance? So what are those things that get in the way of you being a good high performer? From Joseph Process, absolutely. So what's behind all of this is some, some driving needs. And, and Joseph, you have a pretty big driving need based on that response of freedom. You know what? I kind of don't like to be constrained. You know, it, 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 it just, you know, having to follow that process. You know, let, give me a bit of room here, right? Um, from Dimple, lack of clarity and direction on projects. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Clarity and direction. Just, yeah, I love that one. It's, you know, we need to know where we're going. And we're going to see which hormones are actually released when you, when you have that in just a few moments. Uh, motivation, praise. So getting some of that feedback that, you know what, I'm actually doing a good job and, and, and all of that. Um, micromanaging um, from Donna. Yeah, that's, that's a toughie, right? So again, needing a little bit of that space, a little bit of that autonomy. Uh, lack of common goals from Phil. Yeah, th that's significance. That's about how do I get things done? How do I move these things forward? Uh, from Rich, details, right? So, uh, and Rich, this is what causes interference for you. So is that the details are the interference or, or you need the details? Just give me a quick, quick one on that. Uh, lack of decisiveness in leaders from Chelsea. Oh, yeah, that just drives me nuts too. Oh, from Rich, getting caught in the weeds. Yeah. Yeah, so some of us really like to go down into the weeds and work in that area. Others of us prefer to be up in that larger picture and either's right or wrong. It's just who we are. <clears throat> um, pointing at mistakes if they were at the end of the world. <laughs> As if they were at the end of the world. Oh, Alex, that's an awesome one. Okay. And then finally, conflicting priorities. Love it. So when we think of engagement, and remember, we talked about engaged and exhausted. So let's take a look at engaged and energized. When we think of engagement, we get words like loyal, dedicated, committed, focused. These are all good things in an employee, yeah? Let's think about words we would use to describe energy. Passion, focus, connected, resilient, innovative, in flow. Now, you think about someone who's engaged. Yes, I'm loyal and I'm dedicated and I'm putting the hours in, but you know what? I'm just, I'm exhausted. I'm not being effective. You get energized. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, now I'm passionate about it. Now I'm in focus. Now, now I, can, I can get in there and get the job done. Because we can be loyal and dedicated and exhausted. We can be committed. We can, we can try to focus, but we're exhausted. And you're sitting there staring at your computer going, I, I, I just can't get started. I'm just like, what, like, can you believe what, what Sam said? Like, it was two days ago and I still can't get it out of my head. What the heck? right? 
but you get in people who are passionate and focused and in flow and connected. And, you know, those are those days when, when you get a week's worth of work done in a day. You know, this is what we're talking about. So let's think about how we can energize. What is your multiplier? What energizes you? What are the things that make you really stand up and say, yeah, this is why I get up in the morning and this is awesome. And for me, it's about helping people. It's about making a difference in the world. It's about working with folks like you and walking out at the end of a session like this and going, you know what? Yeah, that, that was good. And, and, and we've moved the needle, even if it's just a little bit. So what multiplies your energy? What, what drives you? This is the part where y'all start talking and, and typing. And you can unmute if you want to go that route. I'm totally fine. Optimism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so seeing that, that end state, seeing that, that larger piece. Contributing to things that make better for people from Chelsea. Yeah, so right there with you. Someone unmuted. Do we have a, a verbal? Any others? Hearing back on a good job, well done from, from Miret. I hope I got your name correct. Um, yeah, because, you know, we want that feedback. If you think about the worst thing you can do to a human, take the most hardened criminal and how do you punish them? You put them in solitary confinement. You take away all feedback. We are feedback junkies. We need this feedback. And it's, it's a little bit ironic that I'm saying this in this format right now because, and as Rich will attest and Phil and, and a few others who, who do these types of sessions, um, getting that feedback as you're in a room with a group of people and you're having these conversations and even when it's just a nod or just that look on their face or the uh-huh, it's huge. And it's so difficult in these sessions. And I know when I first started doing these virtual sessions and everyone's on mute and you're talking to just blank, <laughs> you know? So I always, when I do these, I always make sure that I put up the list of people so that I know there's people out there. Um, so yeah, so getting that feedback, recognizing your worth, um, you know, these are all things that energize us, you know, making that difference. So again, again, Rich and I were very much as similar in that regard. Um, Alex, having someone to work together on solving an issue, feeling like someone is with us on the path towards that goal. I love that, Alex. You know, there's that sense of team, that sense of belonging that just, you know what? Yeah, that really just energizes me and, and drives me. I'm loving it. Okay. So I've got my next mammalian image. Drew these out of the work of the uh, Mammalian Institute. And um, so the first one was a koala bear, and it was all about connection and, and oxytocin. So what is this, what is this lady seeing here? So it's a female lion. What is she seeing? The hunt, prey, dinner, absolutely. And what's being released in her brain right now is dopamine. And this is about triggering possibilities. Dopamine unlocks motivation. It unlocks innovation. And it, it's the goal orient, orienting or what we call the, the seeking driving um, hormone. Now, we're in a VUCA world right now. And in fact, I think we have just dialed up the U of VUCA, right? So volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we've, I think we've dialed up ambiguous as well. I think we've dialed up a few of those. And this is really draining for folks. You know, if you, if you talk to anyone who does change management, if you read change management stuff, one of the first things that they tell you is, is you know, give people a bit of a sense of a destination. Help them understand where you're going. What does that destination look like? And this is what you're doing is you're triggering dopamine because we're seeing the goal, we're seeing the destination, right? And then we now need to figure out kind of how to get there, right? But if we don't have that sense of goal or your destination, things are just kind of all over the place and where are we going and what's going on? So with that in mind, I want to take a quick pause here and check in with Brittany because we set her on a task. For sure. And I want to see how we're doing. Let me just share my screen again. Okay. Here we go. All right. So, nice. so far, a little bit of feedback there. I guess, does it work if I zoom in? No, not quite. 
Can everyone see okay? I think we I think we got the picture. Yeah. So we're, and and this is this is the really cool thing that, that you're gonna see. And we're gonna check in a couple of times with Brittany through our through our session today. But you start to see how the image starts to build. And and I'll tell you something, having experienced this in person a couple of times, it's really magical when when you've got someone like this in the room and it just and it just grows. Um, and the feedback we get from our clients is just phenomenal on this. Okay. All right. Thank you for that check-in. You're welcome. All right. And just get back to there. Okay. So we were talking about the whole drive piece and the whole let's think of a destination. And when we think in terms of how people react to change, some people naturally see that and they see change as that, you know, that opportunity to jump into the, into the bigger fish pond, as it were, into the, into the bigger bowl and, and make that leap forward. While others, you know, they're, they're just kind of really seeing this as a big old headache and, and just, yeah, that's not going to go well. Some folks, it's a grand adventure and they just want to leap into the abyss and, and, you know, take the plunge and let's go. But, you know, regardless of how you view this, we've got to think about that Gordian ball. We've got to think, the Gordian knot, excuse me. We've got to think about how we can untangle this. Because one of the challenges with change is that they all pile up on top of each other, right? So that whole, you know, I've got change at work. Okay, so I changed jobs about eight months ago. That was a huge thing. I mean, I was 10 years in my previous role, uh, probably seven years before that in the previous one. And, you know, just, you know, big changes right? Um, you know, you look at changes at home, and that may be in the form of a new union, it may be in the form of a new arrival within your family, or maybe in the form of a departure. And, you know, you start to look at, you know, this change on this change on this change, and at a certain point, you're kind of full, you reach that threshold. And this is really what, what resilience is all about. So our definition for resilience tonight is the ability to remain productive when experiencing high levels of disruption. And disruption is when your expectations are not in line with reality. So I don't think there was many of us who was expecting to be locked down for a couple months. And right now we're experiencing a lot of disruption. We're experiencing a lot of our reality is not in line with our expectations. And when you think of minor disruptions, you know, you hop in the car, you expect to drive an hour, you run into traffic, ugh, right? This is disruption. Um, Gabe just chimed in, nice definition, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna credit this to Linda Hoops from the Resilience Alliance, and we're actually moving into some of her work. Uh, I'm a, a certified resilience practitioner, and we're gonna take a look at a seven muscles model when it comes to resilience. So think of this at a fitness, perspective. We're chugging along, doing our thing. We're working that productive zone. We have a disruption. Now, some people react to that disruption very, very big, right? It's the end of the world. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, the sky is falling and we get into unproductive behavior. And I think we can all relate to this. I know there's, there's times when I've, when I've gotten into that. I know there was a bunch of years back, there was a, a, a dear friend and associate of mine who um, helped me get a job. He was shortly, he was fired shortly thereafter. And I think it was very unfair and unjust. And man, I just, ah, uh, right. The interference chimed in, the disruption. I got into unproductive behaviors. I had trouble concentrating. You know, this was wrong. I wanted to make it right and so on. But over the years, I've learned to be more resilient. So I've learned and created and worked on my fitness so that I have a smaller reaction and a quicker recovery. Because someone who's very fit, when they're facing that disruption, is gonna have a smaller reaction with a quicker recovery time. Now, I mentioned and alluded to that we're gonna talk about the seven resilience muscles. So here's a quick chart of them. And we're gonna walk through each one of them. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a personal glimpse into my life and my world as to how these play out. And I find the best way to do this is, you know what, let, let me walk you down my personal journey here. So I was first introduced to this model in 2014, and sorry, that's my alarm. There we go. Okay, <laughs> I went and turned it off, and yeah, anyways. Um, this is what we call a mixed profile. 
So I had scores from 95 to two and it's on a percentile. So it's, it's, you know, one to 99. Um, with highs in creativity and experimenting, I was leaping then looking. So I was the one volunteering for the project before you'd finished explaining what the project was. Oh, and by the way, I had five great ideas on how to do this. In fact, this was so extreme that in my high school graduating class, I was voted most likely to come to an early demise. I had my driver's license on my 16th birthday. I had my pilot's license on my 17th birthday. I, had a, I owned a motorcycle. I was captain boats. I was just all over the place. If it was there, I was doing it. So creativity is fantastic because it's all about new and different and, and being okay with ambiguity. Some, some really important skills right now, but we need to balance it off with structure. And this, this is kind of, as you can see, we've got a little bit of an imbalance here. Because what structure is going to do is it's going to bring some structure and some, some order to that chaos. It's going to, you know, remove some of that ambiguity. It's going to process some of that data and those creative ideas. So I was getting lots of wonderful creative ideas, but I wasn't, you know, following through and processing them, putting them in, into some nice structure. Experimenting, my other high, is balanced off with priorities. Because experimenting is all about taking a risk, giving it a try, do something different, even though you know it might not work, right? And it's actually this muscle that's enabled to have us to have Brittany with us today, because I was like, hey, here's an idea, creativity, let's give it a try, experimenting. Now, the good news is my my priority score is actually much better than it used to be, and I realized that this is actually within my priorities, and this this is actually a good thing. So I'm learning when to say no. And when to say yes, because every no is a yes to something else and every yes is a no to something else. And that's what priorities is all about. But this was the one that really made me stand up and go, huh? Because I'm a very positive person. I'm a very confident person. And in 2014, I was very down. It's much like what we're facing today. Many of us today through this experience are feeling drained. We're feeling down. We're feeling defeated. Right? And that, that was me in 2014, and I was not happy about this. So with this new knowledge, I decided to do something about it. Just before we go there, connection, this is all about building your network, reaching out for help when you need it. Connection is all about, I need some assistance, so I feel it's okay that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Rich or Phil or Brittany or, or Dimple and say, guys, give me a hand here. Okay. So I set on a path of building. And what happens when you practice, your brain creates new neural pathways. And the more you practice, it strengthens those neural pathways. I want you to think about something you have taken on that you can remember. Maybe it's learning an instrument. Maybe it's learning to drive the car. Maybe it's learning to ride a bike, learning to swim. Um, I was doing this, this sort of, you know, set up one time and, and I had a lady who was probably in her 40s and she just a month before had learned to swim. You know, um, so you think about that and it's very difficult at first. It feels uncomfortable because what's happening is our brain doesn't have the neural pathways to do those tasks. And as we practice, we create those neural pathways and we strengthen them and it becomes easier and easier and easier. And this is that whole, this is the brain science behind the whole concept of habits. If you want to try this out, put your coat on. So I'm right-handed, so right arm goes in first and then the left arm. Do it the other way. Do the left arm first. And it feels really uncomfortable and awkward. And then do that in a training class for the next three years, demonstrating it multiple times, and it becomes really easy. So I'm now ambidextrous and I can no longer use this demonstration. All right. So we've been talking about this journey and this building. Um, and let's take a look at what that looks like in my case. So in 2014, I did my first profile. I took that information, I embraced it, and I worked on it. I went to the gym, as it were. And here was my profile in 2017. And this felt a lot more like me, as you can see the priorities and confidence isn't much up. And then I did it again in 2019. And you notice what's happening is we're getting into closer balance. So where we had 95 to 2, I've now got 99 to 38. It's a huge gain. Um, now, this is, one of the things I love about this profile is that it's half nature, it's half nurture. So part of my nature is creativity and experimenting, confidence. That's part of me. That's who I am. And that's who I'm always going to be. So those are always going to be my high scores. But I can, through 
targeted work and exercise develop those neural pathways and bring my priority score up and I can bring my structure score up and you know I can take those other ones that take a bit of conscious effort. Um, just looking at my desk right now, I have post-it notes. I probably got a dozen or more. You know, I've got this shelf with a bunch of little post-it notes on it and, you know, just little reminders. And this is part of how I do my priorities. This is part of how I do my structure. You know, employ some of these simple techniques that will help you with that. And what's going to happen is as you make these achievements, as you become king of Banana Mountain, we unlock serotonin, which is the, the agency, which is the belief, which is the confidence. You know, this is why when you make an accomplishment, you feel like king of the world, right? So you've, you've just, you know, you've run that marathon. You have, have you know, submitted that project. You've, you've completed that task. You've, you've built a shed, you know, whatever that is. And you feel really, really good. Now, um, we have some building going on in the background. So let's, let's go do a second check-in with okay. and see how we're doing. All right. Lightning quick speed here. <laughs> okay. There. there it is. Nice. <laughs> So we can see it building out. We can see it as, as we're going. And then, you know, by the end of this, we will have created this, well, Brittany will have created this wonderful image, right? But the cool thing is, is it's all based on our feedback and our input. Nice. All righty. Awesome. Thank you. And one more click and there it is. All right. I always forget that second click. So as we make those accomplishments, we get that serotonin being unlocked and we get that confidence being unlocked. And this is why we not only get that energy boost when we deliver and we have the celebration and we want to celebrate that and, and really, you know, magnify that energy boost. But this is also why about two weeks later you get a little depressed. And one of the best things you can do is when you make that big accomplishment is say, okay, what's next? Let's find that next goal and unlock some more dopamine. Let's reach out to our team and our network and, and unlock some of that serotonin and, and, and you know, reminisce on, on what a great job that was. And then let's go and meet the next milestone. And this is why we created milestones. Because milestones feel really good because it gives us that sense of accomplishment. So imagine you're working on something. It's big. It's going to take a couple of years. You've got a plan. You've got a team. You're doing great. It's month nine, and you haven't met a single milestone. How are we feeling? Now, the project's completely on track, but you haven't met a milestone yet. So part of milestones is not to just track your progress so that you can make over. Part of milestones is a motivation tool. Because if you're at month three and you have had, you know, three or four milestones that you've met and maybe even surpassed, awesome. Now, I'm not saying create false ones. And if you miss them, you miss them and you hold people accountable 100%. Don't make them false. But this is part of the whole mechanism of what we're doing here is we want to get that sense of agency. We want to get that sense of accomplishment. We want to get that sense of getting a job done. And this is why on those Kanban boards, you actually take the post-it note off and you move it over. So you get this visual and you see the migration as they move from the left side of the board to the right. All right? This is what's behind all of these mechanisms because we're creating connections at a human level and we're leveraging and working with some of that human, human potential. Okay. Hi, David. Hi, sorry. It's yeah. Phil. Just like a quick question. For Juice, have you found that you set new mile, short-term milestones just given the, the business environment that we are in now and, and with that awesome team that you showed us earlier have you done the same thing now or uh, just be curious about how you've almost practiced you know this really important uh, realization and observation love it thank thank you for that phil um so the first thing i want to address on on phil's question is the word practice and yes we do practice it so uh there's a number of tools that we leverage one of which is called oxygen poker and we pull out the cards and we play oxygen poker with our team 
right? So I have a deck of cards here and we, we, we play this game. And this is all about identifying what's important to you. Now, what we do though, is we do it in the context of the current situation. So when we played Oxygen Poker last week, the context was in the midst of what we are going through right now, what's most important to you? What matters most? And we pose that question. And then we use the cards to help speak for us because it, it, it helps people who aren't as comfortable expressing their needs express them. And what was fascinating, which I've never seen before on, on Oxygen Poker, is that five out of the six all had the same top card. Now, we think about that, and I'm just going to share with you a couple of these cards. So, so and I'll just grab the top one here. Uh, challenge and progress. You know, clarity and focus. Team harmony. So these are, these are some of the types of things that were popping up. And for five people out of six, this was the top card. Now, what does that tell you about your team if that's their biggest need? What's that tell you about your team if you've got five out of six people who are all saying, I need clarity and focus right now? Right, they're, they're feeling a little bit like, you know what, we got some stuff here that's, that's kind of all over the place. So as leaders now, we're faced with this team who's all saying, I need clarity and focus right now. But yet you're saying, I, I don't have clarity and focus to give you because I'm, I'm wrestling with that as well. So how do we protect that energy so that we're not draining our team? Well, here's one way we can use Agile. Now, let's think about the tenants, the basic tenants of Agile. It's about doing very short sprints. So what do we know? Well, we know that things are going to be changing. They're going to be changing daily, weekly, almost hourly. So here's what we do know. And here's what we can work towards. And here's where we can have, let's have a bit of stability within that. And then ironically, we then take the very long-term strategic look. Because the situation we're in today is not the new normal. It's a temporary normal. Now, it's gone past the state of a snowstorm. Because when this first happened, that's a few days, maybe a week, we'll be back to normal. And now we're into, what, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, another, another five or six to go. We're going, okay, we need to settle into our new normal. And then we're going to emerge on the other side. So what we're doing is we're looking for where can we get some clarity and focus? Well, we can get some clarity and focus on the long term. Let's think six months out. Let's look a year out and think of what that's going to look like so that we can make sure that we're not being so reactive that we are just, you know, going in five different directions. And you just have to look at your social media feeds. What's, what are you seeing on LinkedIn right now? What's everyone doing on LinkedIn? What's everyone doing on Facebook? They're all doing the, hey, here's five tips on how to survive COVID. Here's, here's 10 tips on how to do a good virtual meeting, right? Everyone and their brother's doing that, right? We're also seeing lots of, of support circles happening, right? I know, Rich, you, you started one for uh, change days, and, and I haven't joined only because I've already joined a different one earlier, <laughs> right? But, you, I mean, we've got a ton of that it's good and important and it's going to get us through on the short term, but let's think about the long term. So from a clarity and focus perspective, what can we do and how can we protect that? Now, regardless of, you know, which card comes to the top and, and, you know, what, what is the particular situation? The important thing is we're having these conversations. We're connecting with people on, on a, on a, you know, on a basic level. And we're having those open, honest conversations and saying, what is interfering with you right now? And when you ask that question as a leader, you need to really sit back and listen and receive. And then very carefully and, and specifically, why does that matter to you? Why is that important? And that unlocks a whole nother range. 
And now how can I support you? And how can I work with you? And how can I protect that? Or, or how can I remove some of that interference? And what can we do? Does that answer it for you, Phil? That's great. Thank you. That's a perfect answer. Thanks You're very welcome. much. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate the feedback. So, you know, we've got these, these hormones running through our brains, right? Our brain is about 2% of our body weight. It consumes about 20% of our energy. And if we can protect some of that energy and we can actually multiply it and help our teams and help ourselves get through that, we're going to emerge better on the other side. We'll emerge better and stronger. And part of Linda's work in, with the Resilience Alliance is she, she's a researcher at heart. She really loves to research. So those profiles are actually part of a database of well over 100,000 people. And she looks for correlations around, you know, gender and, and marital status and job title and, you know, are you, are you, you know, religiously active? Are you, you know, all these different factors and, and looks for correlations. And for the most part, there's not a lot of correlations, but one of the biggest correlations she did find was experience. The more experienced you are, the more you are resilient. And this is part of why right now our situation is impacting us so greatly because pretty much there's no one alive today who has experienced what we're experiencing. There's the, the, you know, the Spanish flu just, just after the turn of the century. World War II has a similar level of, of interruption. And, you know, we, we still have a few people with us who are, who are, you know, have memories and experience from, from that era. But really we've got, you know, a, a relatively unique situation. We've got a global village that is so interconnected. Um, you know, while we were waiting to get started, I was chatting with Dimple and, and she was commenting about going past the airport and seeing all the planes parked. And I, and I have some friends in the industry who are, who are pilots as well as air traffic controllers. And I was, I was chatting with one of my air traffic controller friends. And he said, if you do the math, there's about five airplanes in the air for every one you see on the ground based on the way that, because, you know, if it's parked on the ground, it's losing money. If it's in the air, it's making money. So, you know, airlines want to keep these airplanes flying. That's, that's how they make money. And um, <clears throat> you look at the number of airplanes that are now parked, right? And we have this global village now where um, there was a British Airways ad from a few years back and they, they had this, this really cool animated graphic of New York City coming in to like flying through the air, you know, and then, and they had the whole air traffic controller cleared to land kind of thing. And in a sing, like at any given time, you've got the population of New York City up in the air, you know, circling the globe on a, you know, a, any given time. Now, currently we don't have that because, you know, we've dropped 96% in our, in our air travel overnight. But in today's world, you can get from, you know, Toronto to London, England in less than a day. You know, it's a few hours. Um, when my mom graduated from nursing school in 1951, she went from New Zealand to England for, uh, you know, the big trip after uni. It took her two months to get there because she went by ship. And that was the quick route because the Panama Canal was now open. About a few years later, um, my dad worked in the airlines and they flew. They went the canoe route or the kangaroo route uh, through Australia. And that took two weeks. And that was by airplane with piston engines and propellers. Um, nowadays, we can do it in a single nonstop flight and we can be there in about 12 hours, like 12, 14 hours. Like it's, it's amazing how quickly, and you think about that from the combination of that with what we've got as a pandemic disease that needs contact to spread. You know, and it's just, it, we, we, we've never had this scenario before. We're figuring it out as we go. And of course, the doctors are learning because they've never seen this disease before, right? So how it's being treated and, and, and all of that. So we need to be agile. We need to be flexible. We need to have those experiences. But as we get those experiences, and I'm just going to back up for a second here, um, you know, we think about the different muscles, and this is where the balance of the muscles comes in, because someone like me who's highly creative, highly experimenting, 
if, if we're in a situation where we need, you know, some quick action, I'm your guy. Absolutely. If we are in a situation where it's more about, you know, that deep analysis before we can take that step forward, I'll help you. But I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm, I'm not probably the best to, to, to tackle that. Right. And the more we can be balanced in ourselves, the more we can, you know, be that, that, you know, multi-tool that's going to be able to deal with all different scenarios and situations. And this is why in some situations you're a rock star and others you struggle. But if you want to build a resilient culture, it starts with you. Now the theme of my whole session tonight is about human connection. It's about helping make change more human. And we need to start with ourselves. We need to put our own oxygen mask on first before assisting someone else. Right? Because if I don't have my oxygen mask on, I am absolutely useless. So let's get our own oxygen mask on first. Let's take care of ourselves. Let's make sure that we are in good shape. Then we can start to think about our team. And we can support our team and we can be there for supporting our team. And then we can think about supporting our organizations and, and, and building that larger culture and that larger, um, that larger resilience that we're talking about. So for a closing thought here, um, we choose to learn and grow from an experience to become more disruption ready. We're going to emerge from this. You know, six months from now, we'll be sitting in a bar in Toronto and saying, hey, remember when? <laughs> so the question then becomes, is it going to be one of those memories that is, um, is it going to be one of those memories that you go, yeah, and I learned from that and I'm more resilient and more strong? Or is it going to be one of those memories of like, oh, yeah, boy, that was annoying. Let's shut it out of our memories and drink our beer, right? Because we have this opportunity. We can grow from these experiences. And studies show over and over that populations that go through heavy disruption, that go through extreme challenge, emerge stronger and better on the other side. And those are in larger populations. We're not just talking individuals. Because absolutely, there are some people who are not going to do better coming out of this. But it really is our choice. We have that to, to learn and grow. So I want you to invite me to join me on the path. Um, resilience is a, um, it is a journey. And it is something that, and this is why I redo my profile every once in a while. Because I want to see where I'm, where I'm at and how I'm doing. And it will change. And then I can, I can reassess and I can refocus and I can, I can, you know, figure out where I need to do my development. And, and I love Joseph's comment here. Uh, hope that we can learn and, and much pollution. Yeah. It's pretty amazing to see the and, and some of the, you know, heavily polluted that are just, you know, showing some amazing, amazing, um, uh, you know, the pollution clearing. Okay, uh, we need to check in with, with Brittany one more time. How are we doing, Brittany? Uh, good, let me bring it up. Oh gosh, I just tried clicking on my laptop screen. <laughs> oh no. Oh dear, okay. That's what happens when you're on an iPad half the time. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Up. Make that full screen. There we are. That's right. Fire. Yes. This is looking pretty cool. Yeah. Everything. I know, guys. What do you think? How's how's this how's this looking? I got I got two thumbs up from Rich. Oh, lovely. Thanks, Rich. Got an awesome from Gabe. Thanks, Gabe. Phil's clapping. Yay. Right. So um, I believe the, the plan, correct me if I'm wrong, Brittany, but you're going to do just a little bit more touch up and, and uh, clean up of that. Just a touch. And then uh, she's going to post it in the chat. I am. So I'm going to open up the, uh, the floor for anyone who wants to unmute or pop into the chat. Um, and 
what are your questions? What are your thoughts? Let's keep the conversation going. We've got about another five minutes before Rich is going to crack the whip and, and tell me my time's up. David, this is simple. That was fantastic. Hey. Thank you so much. And also thank you, Brittany. My question is about the assessment tool I use. Can you tell me the name of it and where we can get it? Sorry, the which? The assessment tool. So for the assessment tool. So um, it's it's resilience. Um, it's basically it's a personal resilience profile. Um, contact me. Uh, okay. This is part of what we do. Um, so I'm a, a personal resilience practitioner, and I've been madly scrambling to turn it from a in-person product to a virtual. And we've got this uh, brand new self semi self-paced half self-paced half in-person virtually facilitated blended model that we're uh we're testing internally literally today um so that should be rolling out and available for folks in a few days and if you want to be sort of on the early test of that we would love to to work with you on that and we're doing a special intro price around that so just contact me and go with that great thank you pleasure Hi, David. It's it's Phil, and and uh, the, the last comment you made about um, six months down the road, and we're all drinking a beer. Let's just say you're all buying us a beer. Everyone who's listening to you now, just, let's just say <laughs> I'm feature facing you, and so we're all around. We're thanking you for the free beer, uh, and then we're talking about lessons learned. Is there any reason why? you can't put in a milestone now, like let's just say with your team, just because we, we saw everyone there, where they're actually tracking lessons learned now, because I would imagine every week there, there's oh, new reflections. We, we 100% are. We're, we're doing this on an almost daily basis. It's about, you know, what are we learning and, and how are we growing? Um, we, we've started a bit of an informal Monday morning extra piece. Um, and it, it, it started with a bit of a fun exercise of, of sharing childhood pictures. And um, then we went into a um, lessons learned um, thing where what we did is we talked about an event within our lives that we'd been through that would be COVID-like. So something that was a big disruption in your life. And what were the lessons that you learned out of that? Um, so one of our, our team uh, reflected on 9-11 and how, um, you know, Muslim became, you know, bad. And she was like, well, it wasn't before and that seems really wrong. So she decided to go take her family on family vacation that summer to, a, you know, a Muslim country and they ended up going to Turkey. And what was amazing was she showed pictures of these historic sites in Turkey pre 9-11 with hundreds of people and post 9-11 with her four people, her four family and one other family, you know, on a, on a, on a tour bus, it's normally 65 people. There was eight, you know, um, and just how, you know, we do move past that and we do get beyond it. Um, uh, another shared with us, um, you know, when her father passed away and how the lessons she learned from that have you know, helped her as a mother and a wife and, and just a human in general and how she's been able to, you know, advocate for people who are sick and deal with doctors in the medical profession in a really, really effective way. So, you know, take that time to think about what are the good things that are coming out of this, change the narrative and think about what are the lessons that you're learning. And, you know, even today we, we ran a test session of, of our oxygen poker game online and this is our second test session. And, you know, we're just, we're constantly learning from it, but we're also looking at how does that fit in that post, you know, world. Um, and the kind of cool part is, is we've had on the back burner to do a bunch of this virtual delivery, virtual facilitation pieces. And it's kind of been, you know, bouncing around in the back burner for years. Now it's up to the front and we're making progress. And, and really great progress. Fantastic, thanks so much. My yeah, pleasure, thank you. Um, Gabe was saying, I was wondering if you could share more about the become really resilient ready with reference to the slide before this piece. Yeah, so um, so Linda Hoops who, uh, and, and thank you Rich for, for getting the name in there. Um, her first book was called Resilience. Her second book, which is the updated of the first, it's, a, it's based on the same models and a lot of the same theories, is called Prosilience. And the idea here is to shift away from a reactive model to more of a proactive model. So what can I do today 
to be more proactive so that I'm ready in the future, right? And in, in sharing a bit of my personal story, um, this, this was, you know, when I was introduced to the model and I'm going, this isn't right and this isn't good. So if I was facing some of the challenges that I faced in my life in 2014, I would not have been nearly as effective or capable. Now, July of 2017, I did my profile and I did it for unrelated reasons. But in the fall of 2017, I had a huge personal challenge. Um, I had uh, my mom passing away from, uh, you know, lifelong illness. And she was 88, so she was, you know, had a good long life, but she finally, there's huge internal political stuff within our family around that. Um, we were facing a buyout at work. We were facing, you know, 100% turnover, um, just all kinds of stuff. And it was all just piling on top of each other. And because I had done this work and I had, I had increased my resilience and I'd increased my preparation and thought about it in future terms and, and gone to the gym, as it were, I had that capability to be effective. Um, if you want to dig into that a little bit more, uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug. Um, I did my first TEDx last October, and uh, this was the context of my TEDx was that, that, that period in my life and, and how this resilience work helped me through it. So uh, if you just Google my name in TEDx, you'll find it. I hope that answered it for you, Gabe. Cool. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure. Appreciate that. And, uh, uh, just for insight, I've done the profile with Linda three times as well. And should we just say we're not totally dissimilar on that? Profile? <laughs> what is that? Not surprise me, sir. So I was kind of, I did smile to myself, although I think you have a higher structure than me. Oh my. <laughs> See, I would not have, I would not have pictured that. I, I would have put you as a higher structure than me. No, that's it's, interesting. It's, it's, again, it's the, the taught habit rather than the natural instinct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you're, but you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're dialing that up, even though it's not your natural and that's the, that's the nature versus nurture piece, right? So you can, you can exercise that muscle and develop that strength. Yeah. Um, Chelsea just commented on the chat. Linda Hoop's current book is being offered for free in the Kindle version for a limited time. So as part of her giving back to the community yeah. and the world, um, you can find that on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would say, you know, I, I've, I've known Linda myself for what nine nine years, almost ten years. Mm -hmm. A lot of her work, I would say, is amazing stuff and everything. So I totally get, and I would recommend the books to read and all the rest of the stuff as well. So um, love it. I've got time for that. Definitely and so. Rich, um, there's one comment that just popped in from Gabe. Um, in your experience, would you say that we become more resilient based on life experience? And I'm going to answer that question really, really fast. Yes. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. But we also have the choice because it's about how you receive those experiences because they are gifts. They are, they are lessons and it's about how you receive them. And if you decide to have a growth mindset and take them in and, and accept them as experiences and learn from them and, and question, you know, what did I do? How did I do that? How could I do that differently? Definitely you will grow. Yeah. Absolutely. Love it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank Pleasure. you everybody for your contributions and the conversations and everything else that's been engaged. Appreciate making it an engaging conversation.